Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 267. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we're excited to have back with us the highly talented and internationally revered comic artist and graphic designer, Seth Martell. Hello. Seth, how's it going? It's going well. I'm having a good night. How, how about yourself? You know what? I'm doing well. You know what? We Before we went live, we mentioned that you were episode 72, and now this is 267. And I, I got to say, Seth, you said, I want to come back on once I have the mayor finished. And you sent to me, you know, like, a, I guess it's called like advanced reader copy of the book yep. in a way, yep. like digital form. And it did not disappoint. I really loved, because I, I was able to read like a couple years ago, like the first kind of like a mini comic version of it, correct? That's what Yeah, essentially the first. first chapter. Right, yeah. And I got to say, well, after reading the mayor, the, like actually reading the full thing, it felt like a preview, almost like an introduction to an entire like Martell verse in a way. It felt like you left us wanting more. That's awesome. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad that you <laughs> like it like that. Um, it's, it's interesting. I didn't really think about it in that way, but you're not the only person who said that to me. So I think that's a really awesome, awesome bit of feedback to get. I love it. Right. And so where can, if people, and it's published through our friends at Graphic Monday, correct right now? Correct. It is, but you can buy it at any place that you can get a book. You can, you can order this, you can order this graphic novel comic book stores it's distributed by diamond and ingram so they have pretty much an in with just about any bookseller that you're gonna you could pop into and you can get this book okay and so talk a little bit about what's like the synopsis not the synopsis of like it's a like i say it's a very very well done story do you want to give people a little bit of like the kind of the back of the book description of the mayor of course yeah so you know my very kind of quick down and dirty uh, about the the story that you just tell people when they're walking by is that it's a book about a girl that is suffering from sleep paralysis, but really she's being haunted. Um, and she's just got to kind of figure out her way out of it. Um, mm. You know, at the, you know, the longer synopsis of it is that it takes place in the nineties and it's a uh, kind of just, disenfranchised youth trying to figure out her place in the world and not only is she kind of just having a rough time growing up and learning how to adult in that weird in between age but also you know she can't sleep and when you can't sleep your life just sucks because you how do you tell people how bad you feel when you're tired if no one can get inside your head and know how badly you're dragging Right. So her life is just coming unraveled. You know, she's having the sleep paralysis at night and she just keeps messing up her days and she's frustrated. So it's kind of a story of how she's figuring out her way and navigating her life to get out of her problems. One aspect that you brought up that, that takes place in the 1990s, is there a specific reason why it's almost a historical setting? And I'm saying a historical setting as in the 1990s. <laughs> That hurts my, hurts my soul. It hurts a lot. Um, <laughs> I picked the '90s because when I was writing this, um, you know, I started thinking about the plot of this before COVID, and mm. I wanted to. This is, you know, I was writing it in my head before COVID, but really sat down to process it and put it all together as we all kind of got trapped in our homes, and that's when I really focused on it. And I wanted to make sure that this project was fun for me to do so it was always like a bright spot in my day but also I feel when you're working on a project if you're not feeling the joy of working on it nobody feels the joy while you're reading it mm. you know while they're reading it excuse me <clears throat> so a big part of it was I wanted to listen to you know some nostalgic music that made me feel good and you know feel kind of back when I was younger and also who I was writing for. I was writing it for a younger audience. So in a way, like I was putting myself in kind of that headspace of the time in my life. Because you're basically wearing two hats on this. You were the, you were the artist and you were the author. Talk about the impetus of how this was, how this story kind of came to fruition. Sure. Um, you know, part of it was that I just wanted to really challenge myself 
to write something and draw something that I was completely in control of. I've, I've worked with really amazing collaborators like, you know, Stephanie Pizzarillo, so you know from the show. And so many people have so many projects that they're working on that even if the, you're stoked to work with a writer, you're, you know, you sometimes you just want to take a minute and do something yourself. So I, I, I sat down and I, I thought, like, what can I do and what do I want to do? So it had been in my head and during the, you know, commute to work days, it was something that I would just kind of dream about and think about the plot and try to figure out clever ways to make it have its beginning, middle and end, but also have it stay engaging and stay, you know, true to the story I wanted to tell. So I would do that and then I would go home and at night I would kind of doodle bits of the book or scenes of the book that I kind of enjoyed or felt were evocative of the story I was trying to tell. And then from there, the next step I did was I, I plotted the entire book out actually in um, just penciled thumbnails on a spiral notebook. Wow. So my plotting was not really like traditional writing, I think, because I'm, you know, because I, I fall into the more visual camp than I fall into, you know, traditional writer camp. So I, I, I drew the whole book first, but in little messy thumbnails that only made sense to me. You know, no one else right. in the world would have understood them. But as I did it, I made little, you know, story plot point um, notes in the margins. And it really helped me develop it because I could look at it on a sheet of paper. And it was a storyboard, essentially. But like, you know, right. a very high level storyboard. So that's what it really took for me to do. And then, you know, to like to get that out on the page. And then when you go to pitch somebody a book, you have to explain your story in a synopsis, synopsis that has a beginning, middle, and end. And it really forces you to take a look at your storyboard and say, okay, does this work when I really, really put put words behind it to explain it to somebody? You know, can I justify all, all the plot points and ways that the story develops in a way that sounds neat and tidy to an editor? So that was, I think, like the really challenging part as you know, a first-time real writer, you know? Hmm. but those exercises help they really force you to do it and do it right so you mentioned the editor how different is the the final product from your original script very little very little changes very few changes wow okay um, <clears throat> the editor was amazing uh kendra wallow wallow is really wonderful to work with she's uh from graphic mundi she she runs graphic mundi and she checked in with me a few times along the way, but really, I think a big part of it was proving that I had a, a solid final product to, to share with her to discuss. And she was instrumental in some really great choices, like making sure that the blue was the main color focus as opposed to coloring it. And I super appreciated that, you know, she held me to it. Um, she challenged a couple like parts about uh, plot points that I needed to illuminate a little bit more on, but I was able to do that with some dialogue edits. And um, yeah, just overall, she just kind of really would challenge challenge me with some questions that I think are important because if she had them, the audience would have them as well. So, right. you know, really uh, illuminated little weak plot points that I could punch up to make the tightest story possible right I, you know what I, I love about it too is like there's it almost fills in like almost like an adult disney-esque story because it's like the, the 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 standard of like a single father like there's always this fun there's this but like how did you how did you decide on what the the backstory was going to be for that how did that work for you Gosh, I don't know. That's really, I, I, I don't know. Um, the characters kind of wrote themselves into like having their own history in their head as I put them into the story I wanted to tell. You know, I, I knew I wanted to have somebody who was in a frustrating phase of her life. And maybe that like extra was put in because of COVID. Maybe, you know, I was feeling frustrated. and But I, I really feel like a YA book people relate to that at that age you know there's just right. not everybody knows the clearest path of their life right then and so many people around them feel like they do even if they don't they're probably just faking it out so 
I, I wanted it to be obvious that this girl was struggling, not in like a terrible way, but just like that average, like can't get out of her funk and can't get out of her own way kind of feeling. And so the cast of characters around her naturally kind of wrote themselves as to like who would help shape her journey. There seems to be like a, a couple types of creatives. Those when COVID hit, they were like, I am completely drained. I'm just going to watch Netflix all day. And then there's others that were, I got all this time now. I'm just really going to take advantage of it. Um, how did, how did doing the mayor, how did this fit for you? It was an amazing blessing of time. Truthfully. I, I, it was so strange, but I just couldn't wait to have the time to draw because my life slowed down. Um, <laughs> you know, I had this story in my head that I was really excited to someday get out there, but I just never had the opportunity to really spend the time writing it because the writing and making sure like the writing was thorough and complete and made sense. That's where like, I really had to sit down and, you know, as an artist, I'm used to doing, you know, but mm -hmm. writing, you have to think and kind of mull things over and tweak. And it's, <clears throat> to me, it feels a, a more passive action because you're, trying to shape right. and form we're writing i'm sorry we're drawing i can actually like get a product out there that you can see right away so right. it's just very different for me and so that time was a, a great time for it and i think it just afforded that opportunity because before that i'd only drawn right and and so before that did you while you're doing this process you also still had jobs coming in how were you able to balance your own passion project with your day-to-day -day work um you know the more work I have the more I get to I feel like I'm more focused when I am doing things but the other thing was this project had no true deadline which was awesome you know it made the story I think better because I didn't have to rush myself I didn't have to cut corners and I also only forced myself to draw when I was happy, you know, and draw when I was excited to create something. So I did take some breaks along the way. And I did, you know, give myself a moment where I wasn't in the mood to draw or if I was in a, you know, if I just was too tired, I didn't want to put a bad product forward that nobody was making me do, you know? Right. And so what would you call the genre for this? So it's a, I call it a YA coming of age. You know, some people think it has some horror in it, but, right. you know, it's light horror for me because, you know, I, that's just my history is, you know, with haunted houses. And um, I, I, I worked in that area, in that field for a, a long time, but I wanted an element of spookiness no matter what, just because it's what I enjoyed. Like I was really inspired by Neil Gaiman's um, Death, the High Cost of Living. It was yeah. a, a three part series and like that had a big impact on me as a kid. And I wanted to create something that was reflective and but also a slice of life you know but right. still had some really spooky fantastic elements that took such a back seat to just walking around town and you know also this kid's you know massive problem that you know he he felt he had because he had a big chip on his shoulder but his life was existing as he was you know working his way through it but and also too i love you can what I love about this is that there, there is a graphic, as we mentioned before, you're also a graphic designer. So how important did you take your graphic designer hat on when you're actually creating the layout of this comic book? I mean, I don't think you can ever take that hat off because you're just, mm. you're, you know, you're, you're building a book that you want to direct a reader through. Like you wanted them to go through each page and, you know, direct the story, but also, <clears throat> You know, you're, you want to hide little things in your art throughout, too. So, like, if somebody rereads it, there's, like, little moments of, like, delight or fun hidden in, in different panels. But, um, you know, as the graphic designer, it gave me the choices to use word balloons as well to move people's eyes through a page, which I, I think are important. Because you just don't want to have a lot of dead space in a page unless it's actually propelling the story forward in a way. Based based off of the story, without giving anything away, you pretty much know how it ends. You as the author know how you want it to end. Um, but did you 
was it always your sense to insinuate that this could actually be um, an ongoing series in a way as well? No, no, not in the least. No, I, I wrote this to have a, a beginning, middle and end because I felt like I wanted to wrap up a story that I felt had, um, you know, just kind of like a journey of a character. Everything else is a little bit of a window dressing on really Indy's journey of, you know, trying to just get herself out of her funk and move herself into a, a place where she's helping herself by helping others, you know, like by also thinking outside of her own head. And that that was kind of the story I really want to tell. And now about about that as well, did you mostly digital or did you do a lot of uh, paper and pencil when you designed this? Once I got out of my little crappy notebook, it went fully digital. So I, I spent, wow, okay. yeah, I spent the next set. What I would do is I would do a chapter at a time and I would move from the pencil, pencil sketches to full size, but very um, messy draft mm -hmm. pages that I would then import into InDesign. So I could kind of do left, right reading, just like I'd be reading a book. And I wanted to make sure that the flow worked when I'd look at them all in, in, in space. And then I would take those 25 pages at a time and I would script them or leave notes for scripts in it. And then I'd go back and I would uh, draw them as finals. And because it does have that feeling about there's a little bit of that rough, especially when you're, when the, the nightmare piece kind of happens, that does feel like there is a bit of a, there's that scratching feel to it as well, to the design. That's awesome. Yeah. What I would do is I would just change um, the different, you know, opacities or, or the, the type of pencil that I'd be working with. And I would just really go at it. You know, it, parts of what I was trying to channel were um, angry high school so, notebook margin yes. scrawl. That's what I was right. going for. You know, like just that kind of like bored in class, angsty, uh, repressed energy feeling so i know also seth is like as we mentioned before that this definitely feels sequely to you do you have what you must be working on another independent project right now so right now um i've just been really trying heavily to promote my book uh because it's just it only just came out a month ago so right. i just was at uh toronto comics and arts festival which is super awesome and then on this Thursday, I'm uh, doing a library talk about it and trying to just kind of navigate how to make sure that this gets out to the world and to other people. I've been thinking about different ways that this could possibly evolve into something else, but I don't think I'm quite ready for that yet. You have a very distinct storytelling style, but also a very distinct art style that seemed would would be able to fit within multiple parts of that world that you've kind of created upon yourself some world building aspects to this by having a like making up a band and and, and all this in the town and but what aspects that you are proud of that you tweaked that you're happy about as it came out um you know i i liked that as the story progressed and i was building around these characters i did try really hard to make the donut shop feel real and make sure that, you know, everybody knew that her dad ran the donut shop, but you never saw him, but you know, he's always in the back room slinging donuts and that, you know, there is a passage of time that I thought was important because, you know, the world is moving, even if a character's life feels static. So I wanted to make sure that the seasons changed and their wardrobe got warmer and, you know, as it moved along, like little leaves would be falling off. You know, they went from summertime at the beginning to fall at the end. And I, I tried very subtle cues to make sure that like their clothing was um, informing the audience of it, whether the audience realized it or not. And those are little things that I, I'm, I'm proud of because right. I don't, I, I wanted the world to feel like it was, it's a, it's a real place to people reading it, you know, that they can imagine things happening off panel or like a, a boring day at work for India at, at the donut shop is still happening. You know, a part of it too, is like part of the graphic design on that is also just the, like the framing piece. Were you deliberate on having like the frames of your, your comic strips to kind of also reflect some of that, 
you know, back, as you said, back of the notebook scribbling. Yeah. I wanted it to feel rough because, you know, the emotions of the character are raw. So I wanted everything to have a raw edge to it because Mm. I I wanted you to get a lot of um, small clues without actually realizing like, like I wanted unconscious clues that you'd read and uh, process, but not necessarily know why you were picking them up. So right. the feel of the book, I wanted to not feel like it was aggressive, but just feel like a little bit frayed, you know, just like mm-hmm. you are when you're sleepy, you know, you're just a little bit on edge or like things aren't just feeling smooth. They're just a little bit. And so when you did that, we put this together. Were you also the one that did all the lettering as well? I did. Okay. I did. Yep. I did all the lettering. Um, the graphic designer for Graphic Mundi was uh, really awesome. Went to the same uh university I did, which was really fun to find out. Um, and she did a phenomenal job just, uh, you know, helping me make sure that um, all my my color processing, because, you know, when you translate colors, there's some different issues, but it was so right. awesome to work with a, a fellow graphic designer that can make sure that like your RGB to CMYK conversions are all solid and, you know, that it's going to print well because cyan is a rough one. Like when you... <laughs> I picked this color that like you, it feels so vibrant on screen when I'm drawing it in my, I, I drew it all in Procreate. Right. And, you know, even in the cover, like this, like the, the blue of this hand, it just, it glows and it's gorgeous on, on screen. And then the minute you, you know, you print it, you, I had to take 14 different passes at just trying to get this to feel bright and not just a flat receding blue. So it was great to know that like after I put the time and investment in that someone would be there, you know, checking the press and making sure and understanding uh, where my nerves were. So talk to us about the symbolism of color in your book as well. Um, You know, like when you think about color, like, you know, uh, the blue symbolizes a a lot of things. Like it's, um, it's this beautiful, beautiful color, but like also like you can make it feel very evocative and spooky. And uh, it helped symbolize um, the presence of Indy's frustrations and her sleep paralysis. Mm-hmm. And it gave me like a, a lovely way to um, kind of signify to the reader as she was falling asleep, how it was creeping into her psyche. Mm-hmm. And it the, the also, you know, I, I, I loved all of like the, the cyan to indigo tones that I could actually put into it, you know, right. um, it, it gave, it gave the depth that also like the shock of blue in her hair was very, you know, on trend of the like nineties time that, a you know, the character is, but it also helped show the reader, like you could trace her around a page because she was like one of the bright focal, focal points with like, with the blue hair too. Uh, and I, I liked that the blue hair tied her also to the ghostly sleep paralysis she was dealing with. Did you, I, I'm just really curious too, did you like study on how to write a graphic novel or is this just kind of like through osmosis of being surrounded by comics your entire life that this kind of came to you? Just reading good graphic novels and, um, you know, listening to feedback as you work with other good writers, you know, I think you learn a lot from working with good writers too. So when you, um, when you get feedback about something you're working on as like part of a a group and part of a, um, you know, part of a creative team, you always try to listen to what everybody's saying, even if you're not the writer, because, you know, I also think a good writer listens to the feedback that an artist gets too, because it helps them write better. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I didn't take any, specific classes i just think that always remembering that like everything in uh, your book has to happen for a reason you know right you know that reason can be world building but it should propel the story along you know right and so i i tried to keep it lean i tried not to make it too too long or you know (laughs) meander too far off um because i was very worried about terrified of boring somebody I, i just wanted to you know leave you with a a good feeling and like, you know, actually understanding what the story is trying to tell you. It's over a hundred pages. The graphic novel is over a hundred pages long. Sure. It's great. And I got to say that like how it's, you have the initial introduction of the main protagonist, 
and what you're able to do, and this is also from the graphic design perspective, is like at the at the end of the second page, you need to give the person the reason to flip the page. The story does pro- progress very well. What, what's what's your advice for those that were thinking about trying to get their own graphic novel published? Sure, I think uh, regardless of the projects that you have and you're working on, it never will be detrimental for you to also do small projects on the side. And it lets you experiment with different publishers, anthologies, and gets you working relationships with them. But it also lets you know what the catalog of that uh, publisher is, is like and what they're looking mm-hmm. for and, and you know, what, they're, what they'll listen to and be receptive to. Because, um, you know, each publisher is trying to fill their catalog with books that are pertinent to them and books that make sense to their line. So you have to know why you're relevant and why your book is relevant. So, and who your book is relevant to, that's incredibly important. So I think it could be the best book in the world, but if it's not the right fit, it's not the right fit. It has nothing to do with, you know, your work. So, you know, everybody everybody gets rejected even if something is amazing it just has to have its right home right that's a good point um and and it's what would you say that your so through seth martell um what are some good homes that you see your your product kind of evolving into are you going to stick with graphic uh, graphic monday are you going to try to write products that seem to fit within their mission and values I mean, it's, it's, I would never say no to working with them again. They, they're a phenomenal partner. And I, you know, I recommend anybody looking for books and reading material to check them out. They have such a rich library and such Mm. cool diversity of, you know, from graphic medicine to um, immigrant journeys to stories of um, memoirs that deal with, you know, intergenerational trauma or loss or, um, just, you know, crisis of faith. I I think that they have built this cool, rich world that, you know, reflects such a broad library. And um, it's just, they, they really, they, you know, they give amazing points of view. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was just, I was at the TCAF table working with them and it was not hard to sell again, all, every book (laughs) that, you know, every book that was there, I, I could, you know, talk to somebody about and why it could be interesting to them if it was, you know, something that they were curious about. Right. And so they can find that at, gra- and it's, it's, it's a nonprofit as well. It's a dot org. Well, it's part of uh, their, their, their parent publisher is Penn State University. Right. Right. So this is a, a graphic was well, originally graphic medicine imprint and then it's uh, evolved into a full graphic novel imprint right you do help do art for a podcast yeah i do um the uh, gray milk and lane podcast is a, a podcast that my friend chad anderson runs and it is recapping i think a lot of x-men comics love you know current runs and the claremont years because those are the nostalgic or you know super interesting ones but he's going he's gone back to the very very beginning to the 60s and went back to see what made you know this incredible empire what it what it is today okay so i had been working with him to um just help brand it and you know get get his logo we updated his logo we um you know gave him some really great image cards that like can help advertise the episode. So that's that, that was mostly my graphic design. I also do a little bit of drawing for them too. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, if people want to learn more about your work, Seth, where's the best place they could go to? Sure. Uh, they can always go to sethchristianmartel.com or um, any of my social media accounts are at SC Martel. Pretty, pretty easy for Seth Christian Martel. Uh, just a lot less to type. So Instagram, <laughs> Twitter, you know, whatever is left in Twitter on that day. Uh, you know, I, I try to post updates there or what I'll be working on, or if I'll be appearing at a show, I try to make sure that I do some advertising on there ahead of time. And so what's next for you now, Seth? 
on extra me is um, just trying to work my way through getting getting the word on on the mayor out there and trying to get it in front of right. some readers and then just getting to, to shows to make sure that people know about it getting in libraries I think is super important as well and uh, next I think I'm, I have a couple different projects that I don't think I'll be the writer for right away I think I need to take a break and just take a back seat and start to draw again for a little bit and as I do that, I always know when I'm in the middle of a project, it helps inspire me to also think about my own work. So I think it'll be a really good time to reflect a little bit to before I start right. writing again. Yeah, and I, I gotta say for those for the listeners and viewers out there, the mayor is an amazing book. As you say, it's a great young adult graphic novel. It's it's a really good read. For anybody that collects graphic novels, this needs to be on your shelf. And and Seth, you did an amazing job, and I'm so happy we were able to talk about it. Thanks, Barney. I'm so happy to talk about it with you, and I'm really glad that you liked it. Don't be a stranger. Don't come on every 200 episodes or so. You gotta come on more often. It took me 200 episodes to write this. just edit that little section out because um i took the time <laughs> to dump my tea from my other one and back into another one so <laughs> <laughs> let me time stamp that <laughs> no more no more uh, disappearing teacups no more disappearing teacups <laughs> <laughs> so